Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this uh, um, webinar on uh, Technopedia Grid Enhancing Technologies. Um, before we start uh, the webinar, uh, let me just uh, introduce you uh, some of uh, the ground rules for this event. I'm uh, Loren Deca, I'm working for ENSOE at the Innovation section. So if we could uh, see the uh, ground rules on the uh, next slide. Thank you. So I would ask uh, all the people who are not uh, speaking to switch off the microphone and the camera. Uh, we will mute you also uh, just in order to, to avoid any uh, background noises and let our speakers uh, just uh, take all the attention they need. And um, the webinar is, uh, is recorded. So uh, once you are uh, in this webinar, you, you actually gave your uh, consent to, 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 this, uh, to this recording. But this is important because we want to share uh, with all the materials and the recording of this webinar uh, afterwards, which you will find on the uh, event website. We will have later a uh, panel discussion uh, where you are uh, invited to, to uh, post questions to our uh, speakers, the panelists, uh, which you can uh, do by uh, writing it to the chat in the Teams. So uh, let's see what we will have uh, today at this webinar. Um, why Technopedia? Technopedia is actually uh, a tool which was uh, developed by ENSOE, in particular the uh, Research Development and Innovation uh, Committee of, uh, of ENSOE. And um, we thought it's, uh, it would be good to, to start a discussion with, uh, with the relevant stakeholders and, and, and to show a little bit uh, this state-of-the-art technologies which are listed in this, uh, in this tool. Um, through the eyes of the the, the manufacturers who are actually developing these uh, these technologies, so therefore we teamed up with uh, two of the uh, European Grid Technology Provider Associations, the and the Europe and uh, Current, and uh, their representatives will uh, will give us a, a glimpse or a little bit of a flavor to to what we can find to the technologies what we can find uh, within the uh, within the technopedia such as HVDC facts and DLR superconductors and don't be afraid of uh, abbrevi abbreviations our speakers will explain you everything uh, which might be unfamiliar with you then uh, we will have Mark van Stippel from DGNR uh, because um, DGNR also uh, published a paper. Uh, competitive progress report uh, last year, which has uh, many uh, similar points to, to this technopedia. So let's see if we can find some, uh, some, some, some collaborations here. And we will have also uh, Ivan Pineda from BIM Europe, uh, who will also talk about the grid optimization solutions uh, related to, to wind, uh, wind energy. So I would suggest uh, that we start. I would ask uh, Bartosz Rusek, Christos Dikakos and Karel Winkler, the working group conveners of uh, the RDI committee of NSOE, who were uh, behind uh, developing this, uh, this Technopedia tool and the report. So Bartosz, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I just want to say maybe a few words about the background to, uh, to this Technopedia. Uh, maybe um, some of you know that uh, we have reorganized the work within RDI a few years ago. And the first intention we had uh, was to organize the work within working group one, assets and technologies. And the easiest way to know where we stand and what are the open points was to design some kind of um, list of technologies um, in order to know, uh, yeah, what do we deal with and what are the open technologies we need to develop even further. And that was the, the major initiative to start discussing and creating a list of technologies with small descriptions. And um, that was one primary reason. And the second one is related to TYNDP. In the former time, RDIC was asked to make an assessment what technologies can be actually used in the future um, in a, um, network planning processes. And depending on the technology readiness levels, the colleagues involved in um, network planning um, 
applied some technologies uh, there or not. And um, out of those two, we have agreed that we will create an online tool, uh, which is accessible by many more people, not only NSOE. And you can share, the, uh, or we will share there our um, view on uh, on this, how we, how we see the technologies and how mature they are. What you will find in every technology sheet um, is the, um, written here very shortly. So the general description uh, present, gives you an overview of the technology, main areas of the applications, main advantages, but you will also find their um, um, technology types um, a little bit in more detail, also main components that are used for this technology. You will find there the advantages and uh, fields of applications. Um, also, we try to assess technology readiness level from this knowledge we had it in the uh, uh, group that actually was involved in creation of uh, fact sheets. Uh, then current fields of research and uh, selected best um, practice examples. That is what you find there. At the end, we uh, have 34 fact sheets on assets, 23 on flexibility, and eight on digital technologies. And um, my team, Assets and Technologies, was involved in creation of this asset fact sheets. If you move on, please. Um, then um, we will come back to, to this, maybe to the concrete fact sheets. I just wanted to show, <clears throat> maybe just say uh, one more word that the Technopedia is available in two formats. The one that actually freezes the present status that we have developed. This is on your left hand side, the report that can be downloaded uh, from NSOE webpage. And also the live tool uh, uh, on NSOE webpage that is regularly updated. So if there are some stakeholders that say, OK, we did hear a mistake or we see it differently, then we start the discussions and evaluate um, some uh, some points new and then we try to update um, this tool as um, as frequent as possible um, so um, you can access it i hope um, and uh, just go briefly through through the content over there if we move on then um, uh, you see the present technology readiness level that has been assessed by the uh, working group one, Assets and Technologies, based on the experience we had in our group. And um, uh, I don't know technology readiness level is probably uh, known, well known for you from technology. It's based or it is originated on the um, NASA um, or National Space Agency uh, of US which says that there is a technology readiness from one to nine uh, while one is uh, the very beginning the general idea technology is never nine means that you can apply this technology wherever you want you can be sure that it's uh, really uh, working and operating reliable and everything is between uh, yeah there are different stages and um, we tried to assess this um, according to our knowledge. And of course, this is the, the major point. If we, for example, here we have uh, some manufacturers, some other users, and um, this is always the point of the discussion, what technology readiness level um, the technology actually has. Um, and as I actually explained, um, that was the view um, a few years ago. So if something's changed, uh, I'm very welcome your comments and your suggestions or the discussions uh, on the topic as such. Thank you. I think I will uh, pass right now to uh, Christos, who presents the flexibility. Thank you, Bartos. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, before going into details about flexibility, fact sheet and how we developed these fact sheets, and also the rationale behind, I would like to say that this was a teamwork in working group three flexibility and markets and it lasted more than two years starting from the previous convener of the working group three Matthias Hoffman from Statnet. 
So um, how these flexibility facets evolved? So this, of course, does not happen at once. First, we established a general framework for power system flexibility. That means we try to understand why is flexibility needed, uh, what are the power system needs in terms of adequacy, frequency balancing, congestion management, voltage stability, and so on. Uh, what can deliver? Uh, what are the available flexibility sources and how this uh, flexibility can be utilized? That means what are the instruments? So in this sense, and uh, this can be uh, identified in the left side of this uh, slide, is that we uh, explored all available flexibility sources regarding generation, what can modify the generation injection, the demand uh, evolving from small to large load and taking into account the electric vehicles, and of course, all kind of storage. So, and then uh, we decided, okay, that these are the sources we are looking into, and then we try to identify the instruments. The instruments could be uh, what is called implicit or explicit flexibility in the sense that what is market-based or what is not market-based, for instance, like price-based instruments or agreement-based or every other instrument. So uh, after establishing a framework, uh, then, uh, and of course, identifying the needs, what you see uh, on the top of this slide in terms of adequacy, stable frequency, resilience, or the grid perspective of congestion management, border stability, we went through 100 or so the, uh, research projects. That means we deep dive in dozens of use cases or not only Horizon 2020 uh, project, but also national implementation projects. And then we mapped all these research projects at, at least one flexibility solution. So, of course, as we uh, Bartos mentioned at the beginning, there is a specific structure regarding its flexibility facet. There is a description. There is uh, the state of the art, there is the TRL level, of course, uh, depending the application, even inside the same part seat. For instance, we have more mature project, sorry, product for congestion management and not so mature for other uh, to address other needs. And uh, also what you see here is uh, one outcome of this uh, exercise the mapping of flexibility solutions. So generally we had three large clusters. The first is the technical ones. That means we uh, map uh, the research project into the technical solutions without uh, trying to identify how these technical solutions will be part of market or will be incentivized. We have the market based and of course uh, the other instruments. So what you see here is uh, and the number of the projects, uh, meaning the number of demonstrations identified the framework of this working group. We took in, a, in uh, account, in, we took into account all types of uh, storage as you may see for thermal storage, uh, chemical storage and so on. Of course, uh, mapping with the different TRL levels. Of course, and uh, thanks for Bart for mentioning, the, mentioning this. This is a dynamic process. This took a couple of years. That means, of course, the technology uh, evolves. So, of course, this should be further fine-tuned and, of course, adjusted to uh, what actually happens today. And I think I'm in time. And thank you for this. Uh, this was how we actually developed 23 flexibility fact sheets, and this was uh, the context. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. Thank you. Okay, so now is uh, my turn. So, well, I think this is only uh, one slide regarding the digital fact sheets. Of course, I can, let's say, then, let's say, join 
uh, more slides how we developed uh, the fact sheets and how we prioritize them. Actually, the approach was, uh, let's say, generally the same as it was mentioned so in the uh, Jan and Christos uh, presentation. So, uh, well, uh, regarding the uh, digital technologies, it's important to say, and I'm the convener of the Working Group Digitalization and Communication, that uh, these technologies has let's say different layer of the application so is this previous one so the digital technologies are in the basement so and they are let's say supporting and solving solution any solution from the area of the asset management grid development uh, flexibility market and so on so therefore um, uh, we need to test so the application technology is the more uh, complex area therefore uh, the prioritization so could be let's say different so and has let's say different accents so as let's say talking about one uh, individual uh, area uh, and this is uh, let's say, actually the role of the digitalization because this is a uh, and you will agree with me and the important part of the uh, energy uh, transformation uh, so so therefore at the beginning of the fact sheets we were asking uh, what is our clients and objectives? So, so at first, so it was the VGFAB members because that time when we started with the fact sheets uh, in the 2018-19, so um, uh, we were uh, launching the digital paper. So it was the members of the working group, and we were the same as the other one, uh, identifying the inter-TSO projects, so case studies. Uh, uh, for the let's say potential candidate uh, for the uh, for the fact sheet. So, and second, we were let's say talking and thinking about the research needs. So, how we can let's say contribute and input the R and D roadmap. The second client, more important, so this is the NSOI business units such as digital committee, system development committee, system operation committee, market committee, and they are responsible from our point of view on the implementation of the let's say particular area of the let's say potential target of our uh, emerging digital technology. So therefore, this is more our innovation input to implement and to improve the strategy and to, let's say, make strategies more efficient, more relevant to the actual technical development. Because as I mentioned, so uh, the digitalization is anywhere. And of course, the digital projects are sometimes very challenging. So they are, let's say, dealing with a new term such as interoperability and everything it was included to the uh, discussion. So what kind of fact sheet so will be good to uh, include into the Technopedia. So therefore, the objective is, let's say, using our fact sheets to build a basis for the discussion on merging digital technologies for the TSO uh, that will enable to identify the R&D projects for the future inter-TSO collaboration. And now, of course, it can be used, let's say, how to, let's say, join the, uh, join the <coughs> innovation projects um, such as Horizon projects or the other, other one. And of course, the same way, so we will present and demonstrate the potential derivative of the innovative solutions so using the uh, digital development. Uh, for this uh, classification, so we did the same methodology. We ranked over the, let's say, 33 potential technologies. Uh, well, for the area of the digitalization, boost, good, we can use the, let's say, standard methodologies such as Gartner methodology uh, of the ranking these technologies. So the 33 technologies will be, uh, let's say, clustered into 11 blocks. Uh, and those blocks are such as virtual reality, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, data management, uh, robotics and drones, satellites, communications. So everything, uh, so it's, uh, let's say, in the, in the, in the technopedia, uh, connectivity, interoperability, and all the, let's say, other ones, so 11 blocks. And then we were used the standard technologies for the ranking, the digital technologies. Uh, uh, we are using the Gartner hype cycle mostly. We are, uh, let's say, uh, looking on the GRL. Uh, on the let's say development on the let's say uh, uh, how long it will take the research and development so how it is actual from the point of doctor actual needs needs and through two workshops and one hackathon so uh, we prepared the fact sheet so which you can find in the 
in the technopedia. And of course, uh, so every year this ranking of the technology is changing. Of course, the needs are also different. Now we are, we are implementing so also the Green Deal and the let's say, other one, let's say strategic documents. So therefore, so we are thinking how to, let's say, implement and to enhance our database uh, using the new technologies. So uh, this is the, let's say, presentation from my side of the digital flag sheet. So as I mentioned, this is an open process. We are trying to be maximum relevant and of course, so uh, let's say uh, to provide you so uh, with the maximum, uh, let's say, information uh, about the, let's say, potential of the available digital technologies. Okay, and I hope so that's also I'm in the time limit. So, so therefore, uh, uh, I'm waiting for your reactions. Thank you, Karel. Thank you, Christos and uh, Bartosz, for giving us uh, an overview of the uh, Technopedia. So uh, next up is the part where we will try to give you a, a sort of flavor to to this uh, some of these technologies, uh, some of the most impactful ones, which are uh, which are in this Technopedia. So first, I would like to invite to the virtual floor Johan Kreiser, uh, Global Head of Market Innovation at uh, Hitachi ABB Power Grid. Over to you, Jochen. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the opportunity to participate here and to contribute. Um, I guess you will. Be, yeah, wonderful. Uh, so I would like to give a short introduction to high voltage direct current transmission and uh, try to avoid the acronyms. So what are we talking about? Uh, I've indicated on the left side of this slide, we are talking historically about connections between two points, maybe two different AC grids or um, traditional alternative alternating current grids, or also two points within an, one synchronously operated alternating current grid. And what characterizes an HVDC link is that you need to transform the AC into DC at the ends of this connection. So you see the converter stations. And between that, you have the high voltage direct current power transmission link, which can be realized either by overhead lines or also by cables. And while the advantages of this technology, why was it used? It's, it, has, it offers pretty low losses. It has also a comparably small footprint for the lines, uh, and there are no limitations, practically no limitations in length, which is something we may not be that used to in, in the context of the European grid. But with AC lines, you usually have a limitation in length for stability reasons, and this doesn't exist with DC. And that defines also the original primary application, which was long distance transmission of bulk power. The other advantage is that it can be also easily combined with cables over long distances. And in case of cable, long distances uh, is, is much shorter than with overhead lines. So the problem of stability occurs much earlier with cables. And uh, that means it was a traditionally a, a very favorite application for subsea cables. And that's also one of the reasons why one of the centers of gravity of this uh, technology has been Scandinavia with all the islands, and if you look at the number of installed DC links, you will still find quite a lot of there, them there. There have been two technology lines, the older one, as you may say, the so-called current source converters, uh, which was the, the first generation of technology. It's available basically since 1954, so it's it's not a brand new technology. Uh, and uh, I don't want to go in all the details. It was the classical uh, or is the classical uh, solution for bulk power long distance transmission. It requires pretty sta strong, stable AC networks on both sides of the link. Uh, and it is available today until ca a capacity per link of 12,000 megawatt in, in China. Uh, and then there is a younger technology line, which are the so-called voltage source converters in, in difference, technically in difference to the current source converters, which are based on thyristor technology. These are built on transistor technology and uh, they have been introduced around 97. The first project has been built. Uh, 
they're able to, to to form frequency on themselves, so they are self commuted and therefore there's no requirements on the strength of the connected AC networks and they can also they are able to 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 start from scratch, so so called start as a black start capability. And they are also more suitable. I would not say that it's excluded with voltage source con converters, but more suitable for multi terminal installations, which is a, a topic I will come back on later in the outlook. Uh, today, these are available also up to 3000 megawatt capacity per line and on the graph on the, on the left side, you see the development of both technologies. One thing that you certainly see is with both technologies, there has been a strong development over the past 15 years. And the reason for this strong development at that time and not earlier is on one side, of course, availability of technology. We shouldn't underestimate the progress made particularly in power uh, electronics, which are the core components of this technology. But the other reason is a, a requirement from the markets. So what you see here is the growth, in, in fact, the growth of renewables uh, resulting in more demand for long distance transmission. Uh, so there was a clear pull from the market for this development. Next slide, please. So having said, uh, this is a fairly known technology, even the, the younger one, the younger generation is now nearly a quarter of a century in operation. So it's, you may say it's a proven technology. So why are we talking about this here, where we are talking about potential building blocks for future power systems and also need for further development? Well, if we compare the application of HVDC in the past and what, how we see it in the future, then there are some important differences. And that's why I call it, it's HVDC in an evolving environment. So if you look at the past, most of the power systems, particularly in Europe, you can say that were regionally balanced. There was not a real need for long distance transmission with thermal power plants. You usually brought the plants as close as possible to the centers of load because that was both most cost efficient and also the best for operational stability. Uh, and that resulted in a situation that long distance transmission was more the exception than the rule. Uh, there were a few cases, a few use cases where HVDC had its place. So that was connecting remote power generation. And here we are primarily talking about bulk hydropower because usually you have to take it where you have the water and you have to bring the power to the centers of load. We had also cases where it was about supplying remote loads. So for instance, offshore, platforms, uh, gas platforms, for instance, where you need electricity to operate them. I mentioned subsea cables already because uh, with cables, the definition of long is much shorter than with overhead lines. So already uh, beyond 100 kilometers, you have to call that long. Uh, and coupling of asynchronous systems has also been a classical application of HVDC in that case, not with a long distance link between the converters, but more as a so-called back-to-back station. Uh, so it was a proven solution, but what we have to keep in mind, this was all very much based on individual projects and there were, I would call it, fairly independent niche applications. And the consequence of that was all of these projects are pretty much tailor-made by one vendor. There's not much standardization across these technologies to, to connect them to each other because this was simply not required. Uh, these were all standalone projects and uh, very tailor-made. In future, there are a number of fundamental differences. The first one is we have this local concentration of generation in Europe. The most obvious case is uh, offshore wind in the northern North Sea and the Baltic Sea. But we also see concentrations of solar power in some regions of Europe, particularly in the south. So we will have local concentration of generation, which is not perfectly matching the centers of load which means long distance transmission becomes more relevant than it used to be. We also see that we will have strongly varying load flows in this system because sometimes we will have, for instance, a lot of wind power and then generation comes primarily from the coasts. In other times we will have not much wind, but a lot of sun and then the centers of generation will be at totally different places. Uh, this is also a situation we didn't have in the past when 
thermal power plants were equally distributed and the load flow situation more or less was relatively stable. Uh, of course, there were some variations, but it's not comparable to what we will see in the future. And that requires that we will be happy if we have means to actively influence this load flow. And that's another thing that the converters can help with in a hybrid structure, having both an AC and an overlay DC structure. And offshore power drives for cables and redundant structures. If we become more and more dependent on these generation assets, we may not want to have each of them being connected only with one line to the shore without any reserve in case of a failure. So the same reason why we build networks onshore will also become applicable offshore. So we need also a sort of network structures, mesh structures. Uh, HVDC brings a lot of advantages here, but the way how it was used in the past is not perfectly fitting to this outlook for the future. So it requires some further developments. And there we are. Uh, next slide, please. So the vision is that we will have meshed structures. And here you, you, you see a picture taken uh, from another webinar that we recently had indicating the need and I think that is where it starts offshore but we will also see similar challenges onshore soon and this requires in a number of tasks we have to work on jointly. One is we certainly need continuously higher ratings for the voltage source converter technology. Uh, we will need to have DC overlay grid concepts and that includes interoperability of the VSC converters, but it also includes control and protection schemes to operate such a system with active load for control, which is a to totally different philosophy than what we have in AC systems. Uh, we will need a number of components which are listed here, and I don't want to read all of them now. I think you can do that by yourself. And even more important, these components which are listed here are perfectly matching with what you find in Technopedia. So for each of these, you will find a chapter there and a fact sheet. And I would like to invite you to go there and have a look at it. And with that, I'm at the end of introducing HVDC and uh, hand, hand over to the moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johan, and uh, don't go too far because we count on you in the panel discussion a little bit. Uh, I will not move away. I, I, I'm eager to listen. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now I would invite to the uh, floor uh, Suzanne Nies, the General Manager of Smart, Smart Wires in Germany, who will uh, present for us the flexible alternating current transmission system also known as FACT. So then the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, a lot Laurent. And uh, I want to first start as now also the board chair of current to really uh, uh, lord ENSOE and related teams for an excellent job, not only on the Technopedia that I think is, is just a reference and more and more a reference for regulators and national authorities. Uh, but it's also the process that we really admired in current. We had great interactions to work on those sheets and we are looking forward to next interactions on a hype cycle and other things. So thanks a lot, Norela, Laurent, Bartosz, Christos and Karel uh, on this one. So now I'm uh, presenting on the FATS devices with a particular focus on what Smart Wires is developing, the MSSSC. Could we go to the, the next slide, please? Uh, so these uh, FATS devices, uh, you see on the right side an overview on the huge family that the FATS devices are. The abbreviation was already explained on the first slide. It's flexible alternating current transmission system devices. Long uh, abbreviations so are focusing on AC, not on what Jochen explained, explained before on the, the DC uh, side of things. And uh, you can kind of group those technologies uh, on this picture in the power electronics based ones, uh, the proper, say, call it fax devices. On the left side, the conventional ones that are switched ones. Yeah? And their purpose is to improve uh, the security and the flexibility of the existing transmission system. Flexibility was mentioned beforehand in the overview that Christos provided as a key concern uh, of uh, the transmission and also distribution system operators 
in a system with more and more variable renewables and the other dimension security, we just saw the system split this year. We saw also uh, the challenges in Poland and all the impact it had on a system uh, on, the, the, on the other connected uh, regional continental uh, Europe uh, AC system. Uh, so this is likewise extremely important and the broad uh, division of those tax devices uh, are done by uh, saying there's the ones that are shunt connected devices that are typically used for voltage uh, regulation. We have the series connected ones typically used on main uh, objective power flow control. We have the ones that are a kind of a combination of the two of those, the UPFC or United Unified Power Flow Controller devices and uh, what I will explain now in the, the, the other uh, following um, slides is the smart wires uh, MSSSC that are series connected devices using power electronics for control and for protection. Let's go to the next slide, please. So here's the, the MSSC concept and its origin explained. Yeah? So it uses a modular single phase static synchronous series compensator, terrible word, SSSC, and it also uh, employs the voltage source converter technology that has been mentioned widely by Jochen and that is used a lot in uh, HVDC and DC uh, uh, applications. Uh, the first time this was used was already in 98 in the US, uh, so all the story of smart uh, wires is a Silicon Valley story uh, in which uh, uh, students uh, leaving Georgia Tech University wanted to address a recent blackout in the US in using a first form of what we have today with the smart valve. So this uh, 98 application in the American electric power was part of a UPFC installation. And then another one followed in the US uh, was completed with New York Power Authority and it's still in operation with the VSC. And uh, we use in the power electronics component of smart valve the uh, IGBTs, insulated gate bipolar transistors, and that have been also widely used for the utility scale VSCs, including for Startcoms and the already uh, widely described uh, HVDCs. Next slide, please. Talking a little bit about the functioning here. So this is a very simplified scheme. You see on the left hand side and really simplified It's never existing like that, possibly on an island somewhere. But uh, it's on the left side you have uh, the generation, on the right side you have uh, a largely a consumption and you see four lines between those two points. Uh, in one uh, case, the 0% one is uh, an outage for any reason. Uh, and then you have an overloaded line uh, above with 105% and two lines that are used unequally in the middle. So what that it does now with the smart uh, wires or smart wire solution is that it pushes and pulls uh, the flows on the lines and it can be done on any place uh, in the line or in the substation in order to balance and increase the capacity that can be transported on those lines. And you see on the, the right side, the result of this, this adds 500 megawatt that typically, if not uh, addressed this way, falls into curtailment or part of the big congestion bill only in Germany, we're talking about 2 billion euros a year, raising, rising with uh, the, the cost of reaching the 70% minimum requirement that needs to be uh, up and running by uh, 2026 in a, in a linear manner. So this way we maximize transfer capacity. The next slide shows uh, a use case of the UK. Just this year we have been deploying uh, large amounts of projects uh, in the UK, a grid which is meshed but also has these north-south lines and you see here on the voltage levels that we are voltage agnostic. So we can do everything from the DSO grid to the high voltage grid. You see that those voltage applications are between 275 uh, and 400 kV and with different numbers of phases on the typically three, or it's always three phases in the AC grids, uh, sometimes two valves, sometimes five valves in order to optimize uh, the power flow here. Um, we have uh, more than 30 more projects to come in the UK. Uh, you see there that uh, we deploy extremely fast. That is also 
an important argument for using our and other technologies such as DLR. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's important that when you have delays on the plant network, by the way, it's needed network. Uh, I'm not saying that this is alternative to more networks, but sometimes those Südlink type things come late and you need to use the time in between and avoid to put on customers huge costs with uh, very lengthy and late and unflexible solutions. So installing quickly is saving money to the customers of, uh, of Europe. Uh, it's also com cost competitive. We have seen that in the UK case that we are saving more than 387 million pounds uh, compared to the new, new circuits or PST equivalent solutions that could be put uh, in place. And it's also uh, very flexible because we can uh, augment it like Lego or we can relocate it if the network conditions are changing. And now my last slide tells you something about uh, the future of, of this application, part of the, the facts family. Next slide, please. So yeah, here's also good. Okay, so what is the future uh, of this technology and potential fields of deployment? Already today, we work with a number, nearly all of the TSOs in Europe, uh, on how to free up the capacity on the existing grid. Needs to be mentioned here that companies like Smart Wires, yeah, we are 10 years old. We invested $200 million in the technology. We are kind of moving from an RD company to a uh, um, uh, production company and deployment company. Yeah? So uh, the, the first obvious low hanging fruit is load, load flow uh, control. Yeah? We see interest also by DSOs, like in Spain, talking to us, Iberdrola, several others. The technology has been deployed in several countries. Uh, I should mention APG and Austria here as well, that uh, will come uh, in 21 for first uh, project um, and for first demo project. Yeah? Um, we work together with other companies. Uh, current uh, is currently working with uh, Consentech on a study, looking into the combined benefit of the grid technologies that this association represents. We come out of it uh, to the infrastructure forum. And so a smart device looks into other applications of uh, our devices. That is uh, about the increase of uh, interconnection capability. It's about phase oscillation damping, dampening. It's about uh, mobile technology that we will precisely deploy uh, for this uh, test in, in, in Austria, about phase balancing, a curative post and minus one response, and also very uh, up, to, up to date, let's say, unfortunately, uh, the system separation uh, avoidance. So thanks for your attention and looking forward to the later discussion. Thank you very much indeed, Suzanne. Uh... It's good that uh, on the last slide uh, you already mentioned uh, DLR, so it gives a good connection to our uh, next presentation, which will be uh, given to us by Rena Kuwahata, who is business developer uh, Anna Simon. And uh, Rena, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. My name is Rena Kuwahata. Uh, I'm the business developer uh, at um, Anna Simon and also the vice chair at Current. Today, I'd like to present to you about dynamic line rating. Thank you. So what is dynamic line rating? Uh, it's a technology that makes visible the real or true capacity of power lines. Um, as we all know, electricity traveling in a metallic conductor, it produces heat. And the maximum amount of electricity that can be transmitted, it depends on the clearance, the safe distance to the ground, and the maximum conductor temperature to avoid annealing. In the past, before we had sensors and computers, human engineers would determine the maximum amount of electricity that can be transmitted through a power line based on static and conservative conditions. And this means assuming that the power line is always exposed to the hottest conditions, being 40 degrees Celsius air temperature, close to no wind, and full sunshine, even at night. And today, as we have intelligent sensors and sophisticated computer algorithms, we can monitor in real time the actual heating status of the power line, like the sag, the conductor temperature, and the current current flowing in the line. And also we can forecast with fairly good accuracy the weather parameters like air temperature and wind speed, which exhibit the highest cooling effect. So in summary here, uh, the dynamic line rating technologies, they collect field measurements, and incorporate forecast weather parameters in an IEEE or CGRE 
heat balance equations. And with this, you provide information about the extra capacity that's safe to use for operation of the grid to the TSO. Next slide, please. Thanks. So um, dynamic line rating is already used by many TSOs today. It was shown at the beginning of uh, today's session at, that it's already reached a TR level nine. Uh, the most obvious monetary value is created when the extra grid capacity is used in processes that incur a cost. For example, uh, here you see it may cost uh, 20 to 500 uh, euros per megawatt hour to resolve grid congestion, so congestion management action, uh, through uh, remedial measures like counter trading, redispatch and curtailment of renewables and so on. And this means that if you can avoid having to carry out these remedial actions, you can reap enormous benefits in the form of savings. And uh, for the case of renewables integration, since the production is heavily dependent on the weather, it can cause fast deviations on the loading of the power lines. And to ensure at all times N-1 grid security, the visibility of the line capacity with dynamic line rating technology allows faster integration of larger amounts of generation capacity without compromising the safety. And the other key use case that is under particular attention today is the use of the extra capacity forecasted by dynamic line rating technologies to be used for increasing the amount of cross-border electricity trade, uh, where there is a, a large price split between different regions. A little extra capacity, even a, a percent or two, can reap enormous benefits in a short amount of time. The next slide, please. Thanks. So I mentioned the main use cases in the previous slide, but there are also other benefits which are perhaps less obvious. That's what, what, uh, this is what I'll explain next. Uh, with accelerating pace of energy transition in Europe, the amount of grid operation that needs to be done to safeguard the, the delivery of supplies is increasing every day. So dynamic line rating is a safe option to apply as a remedial action, which requires uh, actually no action by the grid operator, as opposed to other typical remedial actions, which are uh, tapping PSTs, they were mentioned by uh, Suzanne before, could be to coordinate topology changes or to uh, execute a redispatch action. Um, and so the safe stress in the control room is a non-monetized benefit, but it's definitely one that's very appreciated by TSOs. And then uh, the second I skip actually to number six, but uh, by having better view of the real, real time, uh, by having better views sorry, of real limits of the power lines, you can avoid inadvertently overloading them. And as you may, sorry, there's a question popping up. I'll come back to that later. Uh, as you may recall, uh, the traditional way of determining the, the line limits, as I mentioned before, was assuming 40 degrees Celsius of air temperature. But with uh, increasingly frequent heat waves, it can be well over 40 degrees Celsius. And by having a proper monitoring system, you can alert such situations so that they can be avoided. And finally, there are elements of economic benefit by squeezing extra capacity out of existing grids. And by using the existing capacity to the full, you can dispatch more cheaper energy and you can even uh, be able to delay the need for a reinforcement. However, here I, I have to point out that the objective of dynamic line rating technology providers is not to convince everyone to avoid new grid infrastructure to be built. We need new grids we should just aim to use them efficiently, both old and new infrastructure, so as not to create stranded assets and to be efficient in the way we build and use infrastructure. Next one, please. Thanks. And so finally, what is the vision for the future of dynamic line rating? On this point, uh, first, I want to tell you that dynamic line rating is not really a new technology. Uh, most countries in Europe have already tested this technology in the past decade or and uh, all of the colored countries in this map here are known to have tested dynamic line rating until today. Um, it is, however, true that some countries are more familiar with the technology than others. Uh, for example, those in the purple here have some kind of uh, dynamic line rating integrated already into their SCADA and EMS in the grid control centers. Uh, some of them also go to the next step to use forecast dynamic line rating into the capacity allocation and congestion management processes 
as well as the coordinated security assessment processes. Um, another interesting observation by uh, the dynamic line rating technology vendors at current is that many TSOs are now moving on from pilots to large scale tenders. And this indicates that the technology is more and more being accepted as business as usual. However, uh, there, are, uh, there is ample room for improvement in terms of the speed of uptake of this technology. And that's what we go to the last point, Outlook. And particularly in the light of this 70% uh, cross-border capacity allocation rule, which has been in effect since January 2020, and also with the ongoing ramp up of renewables in Europe, these two elements combined, uh, these create immense pressure for TSOs to adopt quickly effective solutions to de-bottleneck the grids and to ease the rising grid congestion costs. So large PCI projects and reinforcements will indeed be effective to de-bottleneck the system, but these large infrastructure projects are not implemented quickly, while dynamic line rating can be deployed in under one year to provide quick relief. And despite uh, the mounting pressure, the wide, wide, wide scale sorry, adoption of dynamic line rating remains slow. And to accelerate this process, we see as key the following three things. First, for regulators to implement output-based incentives to allow TSOs to claim part of the benefits of reduced congestion management costs. Two, to foster uh, knowledge sharing between TSOs uh, in how to implement DLR in the control room, how to integrate it into the operation planning processes and how to ensure safe IT integration. Third and last, to leverage from what has been achieved so far by peers and vendors who have established robust dynamic line rating systems through years of implementation in various geographies. It would be more constructive to aim as Europe to maintain globally state of art position in this technology rather than attempt to create from scratch homegrown versions. And with that, I finished my presentation on dynamic line rating. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rena, and thank you for uh, keeping your uh, your time. I would ask the same from uh, John Fitzgerald, who is representing uh, Supernode, the CEO of uh, the company, to present uh, the fourth uh, selected technology uh, we will have uh, for today, which is uh, surprisingly doesn't have any abbreviations. Uh, so the superconductors, the floor is yours, John. Thank you very much, Laurent, and thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this, which, which is, I think, is a really important forum um, as, as we deal with the challenges in front of us. So what is superconductivity? And many of you might be familiar with it from uh, some of the settings that are quite exotic in terms of MRI machines and so on. It's a phenomena that, that's been discovered over 100 years ago. Um, and in the 80s, uh, high temperature superconductors were discovered. And it's a phenomenon whereby some materials, when cooled below a certain temperature, display characteristics where there's zero resistance when they're below their critical temperature. So what that means is they don't heat up um, um, and the resistance reduces to zero. So there's no losses uh, in the electrical losses associated with them. Now, that also means you can put more power into them um, because they don't generate heat. Uh, and high power density is, is, is a particular application where you can get more power into a smaller space and that leaves you with a smaller right away. So you might have a right away for uh, 10 meters for uh, uh, traditional cables for a large bulk power transfer for, uh, for a superconducting cable that can be reduced to as, as little as a meter. So effectively, um, you're changing quite a lot number of the parameters. And the cost of the cable can be higher, but for projects, the overall cost can be lower. And we have seen uh, commercial superconducting projects uh, start to take off now. Next slide, please. So what's state of the art? So on your left here, you'll see a, a, a project, which is a, a Nexens um, cable uh, that was used a, in the Ampacity project in, in Germany, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. And here you see it's a, it's an AC cable. Uh, it's three phase. You can see the three phases. Um, and what you have is a is a, a cryogenic outer um, cryostat, which basically keeps the superconductor uh, cool. There's a copper shield around it for fault current, and effectively liquid nitrogen or another cryogen passes uh, through the center of the the core and back through the annulus and keeps the whole thing cool and lossless. And uh, these cables have been developed. They're in the Technopedia. They're at TRL 8, or some would argue 9. Um, they're in existence. Um, and then there, there's, 
different type of cables like superconducting cables can deal with both AC and DC technology and um, they like uh, AC, they love DC um, and as part of the Horizons project a couple of years ago, the Best Paths project, um, they, there was a trial done uh, with a superconducting cable with DC power and a single uh, pole um, carried 10 kiloamps and that at 320 kV, which is 3.2 gigawatts. So if you had a, a bipole, you're looking at 6.4 gigawatt uh, in a very small space. Uh, and that was a, a low temperature superconductor actually. Um, and on the right then, you, you'll see uh, some of the work that Supernode are doing. And the area that we're working in is really, is the tape is where it needs to be. Uh, technically, um, but the cryogenic cooling systems need to be optimized further and their, their range and application extended, particularly in Europe, where a lot of our, our power is going to come from the offshore arena. Uh, we need superconducting cables and uh, Supernode. We, in Supernode, we've developed uh, in the last two years, we've developed uh, um, a system uh, that has received a statement of feasibility from DNVGL. Um, and that's that's really important um, as as we grow the confidence in this in this technology, and what we see here is a is a is a different type of cryostat to to house the superconductor, and it's really a it's a special type of uh, metal that's used with a very low coefficient of thermal expansion because if you cool these down to minus two hundred degrees uh, centigrade, it's very important that you don't have contraction and expansion as you cycle. So this is the area of work that that Supernode are interested in. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the use cases for superconductors today, they do exist in the grid and their use case is limited today to urban settings. And um, so there's a project in operation uh, for seven years now in Essen in Germany, and that's a distribution project that has been that has been run there successfully and um, there's also a project in Chingal in, in Seoul, which is also uh, a two kilometer. Um, well, it's one kilometer, but there's a second part coming uh, section of distribution cable in Chingal in Seoul in Korea. And I actually visited the opening of that um, and I was there when they opened it and it was a commercial project um, because the, the land take and the, the real estate uh, even though the cable was more expensive, the overall project was more competitive because of the losses over the life and also the, the amount of costs associated with the, the, the way leave. So there are two projects and two use cases and there are more projects uh, planned today. There's one in Munich, the Superlink project, which will see the, the range and, and capacity of these extended up to 12 kilometers and over uh, to uh, 500 megawatts in capacity. So they are growing. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, looking out into the future and beyond 2030 particularly, um, there's a new approach to grids. And Jochen mentioned earlier that the, the largest uh, DC link in the world is a, is a 12 gigawatt DC link in China. And this is what it looks like. It's, um, it's 1100 kV. Um, it's really long and it takes power from, from the, the, the uh, remote regions where, where they, can, they can make the power uh, largely renewable and take it to the to the east coast where, where all the um, the population and demand is. But if you look here at the structure, you'll see that it's it's quite a, it's a bipole, uh, 1100 kV. You see the size of the the, the pylon is enor is enormous. And if you look at the the single pole nearest in the picture, you'll see that there are people working on the pole. So you get an idea of the scale of this. And and it we require similar amounts of bulk power transfer capacity in Europe in the future as we move to renewable based power systems. And the challenge for us is, is to move that amount of power. And I don't believe that, that those type of structures will be uh, acceptable from a, from a public acceptability perspective. Uh, and particularly in a marine setting, uh, it's not possible to do them. So I think we have a challenge and superconductors, I believe, are the answer to economically meet that challenge. Uh, next slide, please. So here is a, a, a potential use case, uh, which uh, Supernode in, in, in collaboration with Catapult in the UK and Strathclyde University have done some work. And this is um, uh, a connection system for a two gigawatt offshore wind farm. And if you look here, typically a two gigawatt wind farm, they're the largest connections we have at the moment in, in Europe or anywhere in the world. 
and they're moving towards 525 kV HVDC. Uh, 100 kV uh, superconductor could do the same could do the same job. And what you do is you obviate the need. So if you look at the the first scheme here, schematic on your right, you'll see the wind turbine, and then as you move across, it's converted to to AC. Um, back to DC and through a HVDC cable to shore, back to AC and onto the grid. And with the alternative superconducting scheme, you're able to to take out the the, the large platform and just go DC all the way effectively um, and save quite an amount of money. And that's an early application that we believe is uh, could save significantly up to 35% on the cost of the overall connection. Um, next slide, please. So areas for further development. Um, so bringing this, this cost competitive solution to market, uh, I think that the work ahead of us in the coming years that we're taking on uh, with others is the superconducting cable system development and qualification program. And we're well on our way to that. Deployment and demonstration projects are going to be key to, to develop confidence in the long distance capabilities of this technology. And industry collaboration, and today is great to, to see the community come around and, and look at the, the new options that, that are going to help help us to electrify our economies and, and decarbonize them. And I think most importantly is to establish a secure and reliable supply chain into the future. So uh, the availability of materials is going to be a, a big issue as, as we decarbonize and there's a very supply there's a very robust supply but it needs to be secured and developed as a supply chain so that's that that completes my presentation thank you thank you very much also uh john to you i think this four presentation already showed a uh, great variety in uh in the uh, clearer levels and and uh, the other um range of diversity of the technologies which you can find in the technopedia so and it was only uh, four of them and as you could remember uh, it was uh, about 70 technologies we listed in the technopedia so it's really uh, worth a look so next up is uh, mark van stippel deputy head of unit from dgnr because uh, you also published a uh, report, competitiveness progress report, which gives an overall state of uh, competitiveness in the EU uh, clean energy sector. However, you also in this report uh, took uh, into account many of these uh, of the state of the art technologies. And this is the, the connection point with the Technopedia. So Mark, the floor is yours and I will share the screen for your uh, slides. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Laurent, and thanks, and so we, uh, and of course, uh, everybody who has uh, helped to realize this Technopedia tool. Uh, a real pleasure to be here, and uh, I've listened with great interest to, to the things you are presenting, uh, and I'm, I'm learning a lot. So uh, thanks already for that. Um, I mean, you asked me to talk about the competitiveness progress report. So I prepared a bit of a presentation to say what we're doing there. But um, to be honest, when I was now really looking th into more detail into the uh, Technopedia tool, um, I thought there are some other things that I should mention as well. So I will also talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, Horizon Europe wise and um, what we're doing in terms of digitalization, um, because I think there is also um, some, let's say your work uh, in setting up this Technopedia tool is also very relevant for us from uh, the work we do on digitalization. Um, and of course, um, maybe I should start off by, uh, of course, saying, you know, the bigger picture of why we're discussing all of this. I think this, uh, you're all aware, our colleagues are uh, working very hard, and I think I'm not lying if I say day and night, to get the um, uh, the legal proposals ready for publication, uh, which we call the Fit for 55 package. Uh, so um, we have uh, in the EU agreed to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 55 percent uh, by uh, 2030. Um, uh, so increasing the ambition compared to what we had before, uh, because we think this is necessary if we want to be credible uh, in becoming climate neutral by 2050. Um, and uh, and so that means that we need to um, 
basically propose a plan of how we're actually going to get there. And of course, this includes um, strength, um, strengthening the emission trading scheme, but uh, also the possibility of extending it, uh, looking at how the, uh, the uh, emissions in the non um, ETS installations are covered. And it also, in particular in our DG, means how do we, uh, what does this mean for renewables and energy efficiency? So, um, in particular, an updated renewable directive and a new energy efficiency directive are in the making. And then later this year, also an energy performance of buildings directive and a gas decarbonization uh, legal proposal. So, building very much on the existing gas market. Uh, rules, but uh, looking much more forward to how can we accommodate the new markets like hydrogen and uh, and um, and biogases, for example. So, of course, this is not um, directly related to what we're discussing now, but but it is, um, I think, very important because the uh, uh, integrating all these new technologies and going much faster when it comes to renewables. Um, and, and increasing their share, and I think with 55%, uh, it means that uh, in the electricity system, it will be uh, at least two thirds by 2030. So two thirds of renewables in the electricity system is a big change for the energy system, and in particular for the electricity system, and that uh, requires a lot of changes, uh, and that requires a grid to follow with it. We still we think that what uh, we have done with the clean energy package in terms of the regulation and the directive uh, is is the right framework to make sure that we can accommodate these changes. But it is only the framework, and there is then a lot of uh, work that needs to happen in terms of investments in grids, in terms of digitalizing the grids, and in terms of using new technologies to um, uh, uh, to develop the grid further. And so, therefore, I think what we're discussing here is uh, is great, great for us as a uh, as an input for the discussion. But I hope not just for us, but also for member states, for regulators, um, because of course, uh, one of the things that uh, always comes back um, is you know uh, if if technologies are demonstrated in um, you know be they Horizon 2020 projects or national research projects. How can we get them uh, uh, to be implemented into the market? And for many of the grid technologies, this, of course, depends on the on the regulatory framework and the interaction also between the network operators and the regulators. And so uh, one thing that we have um, we have worked on a lot is uh, is strengthening that link um, between research projects and um, and the regulatory framework when it comes to uh, the grid technologies and uh, the way the, the, the network uh, integrates renewables and all the innovations that are available there uh, through initiatives like Bridge, uh, where we bring many projects together. Uh, they meet at least once a year in a big uh, general assembly, where we then bring in regulators um, to uh, on dedicated topics to also discuss how can these technologies or these innovations that are being developed in uh, research projects and that are, you know, then depending on, on, on research and innovation funding, uh, be taken up by the market as quickly as possible. And of course, this has then, you know, this then also brings it to the next stage, like, uh, for example, what we're doing now, working on implementing acts on uh, data exchange, for example, and I get to that a bit later. But um, we really believe that one of the key things is to is to shorten that cycle by having that discussion much more on an interactive basis and much earlier on, so to say. And so uh, I think the, the, so to say, the old way of working of we, uh, we fund a project, the project is developed, it has a final uh, deliverable and a report, and that report is then the basis for a discussion with the regulator uh, or with us to see how can we actually accommodate this in the legislation or in the network clarification, for example, is too slow. And we need to um, uh, we need to see that we have this interaction during the project so that uh, uh, already uh, the results can be anticipated and the, and the changes that this requires to the framework, uh, for example, for investments from network operators can already be anticipated. And this, um, we're using Bridge as a tool for this, but I don't think this is the only tool um, that, we, uh, that say this alone will not be enough. Um, we need this is a constant effort, uh, for example, also bringing topics to the to to other discussions with um, uh, in the policy framework like the Florence forum. Um, and I think the 
uh, a tool like this, like the, the Technopedia tool, can really help also in, in um, making that innovation cycle, so to say, shorter. Uh, our work on the um, on the competitiveness progress report is in in some way linked to that as well. Um, although here, actually, what we what we try to do is more on the other side in terms of um, trying to uh, identify what um, the uh, what the technologies are that are needed to get to 2050 uh, to be climate neutral. Uh, and what the status of those technologies is, let's say, uh, from the technology development point of view, uh, and also how we are doing uh, on these technologies in the EU, and then uh, I and, and use that as a basis, for example, to see what we can then also do to support it uh, with research and innovation, like in Horizon Europe. So I will. Um, uh, so and also for that, the. Uh, the the tool that you're presenting is, I think, very, very useful because, um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get I'll get to a bit of the where I see the usefulness in a bit. Maybe I give a, a very quickly a, uh, a short this overview of what the competitiveness progress report looks like. So, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, yeah. So this is actually you can skip this. This is. Uh, <clears throat> Um, at the, the report is basically part of the state of the energy union and it's a, it is a legal obligation under the governance regulation to uh, to uh, publish this every year and we do that every year together with the state of the energy union last year was the first time now we're preparing the next one um, and it will be a, 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 an annual document so we can go to the next one yeah and this is uh, then a overview of how it is uh, built up so we have on the one hand a macroeconomic part that looks at um, uh, let's say clean tech and so this focus on the clean energy sector so it doesn't uh, look at all the industrial technologies um, because uh, there are other parts of the commission that look more into that here we're really looking at how does um, the eu's green deal and uh, let's say the climate and energy ambition help to um, to create jobs and growth in the in the clean tech uh, clean energy technology sector and so in the first part we look at the sector in its entirety uh, what is its uh, how how is the sector doing what is the energy economy uh, energy intensity of the economy how much renewables uh, do we have in the system and so setting the scene um, uh, one important thing there is also looking at the the number of employment uh, for jobs and growth and also the level of investment in uh, in r i and then the second part of the report focus on the uh, on individual technologies and there we use uh, those three headline indicators that are there so on the one hand the technology analysis then a value chain analysis and a global market analysis and we have then specified that further in different uh, indicators that we use to to assess the situation so we can go to the next slide yeah Good. So uh, no, actually, we should uh, we should go back. Now I thought I had another. Okay, and because of this uh, kind of indicated that there would be two slides on this, but apparently there is only one. So I think I've deleted a bit too much uh, when I send this. But then uh, let me stick with this for a second, because the the other slides we don't need to show them now. They are uh, giving you an overview of how well we're doing on the on the um, different uh, data sets. So, um, so, so then let me use this uh, slide to focus a bit more on the different technologies that we're looking into. And so first macroeconomic part, what are we doing research, uh, no, uh, technologies and clean tech in general, and then uh, focusing on a few specific technologies. Uh, last year, um, we published a staff working document uh, that looked at basically um, as good as all the different technologies that are part of our 2050 scenarios and that we need to get to climate neutrality by 2050. Uh, and we assess those indicators for all of those as far as they are available, the data, because not, not all the data are available for all the, all the technologies. Um, and that was, a, as you can imagine, quite a lot of work. So this year we will only focus on a few technologies and next, next year we'll do a full update again because we think it's probably 
it's not a good let's say allocation of uh, of spending of of resources within our unit or in, in the commission to have an annual update of all these technologies and all these indicators when, pro, when for quite a few uh, the the data let's say from one year to the next are not uh, that new anyway so um yeah so in in this staff working document which is called the clean energy transition technologies and innovation report um uh, we focused on on offshore wind on ccs on um on buildings uh, for example heating and uh, cooling in buildings but also heating in industry um uh, pv panels batteries hydrogen electrolyzers uh, etc um, and we and we then um, highlighted a few of those things in the main report, the competitors progress report, where we focused on some of the key technologies that were then very relevant for last year, uh, including offshore wind, uh, ocean energy, and also um, uh, HVDC technologies, because that was a very important topic last year linked to the offshore renewable energy strategy. Um, we also had a hydrogen strategy, so we looked at electrolyzers. Um, and um, and we looked at batteries because of the battery alliance work. Uh, so we, we picked a few technologies um, linked to the importance. This year we're doing that again, so we're only updating this information for a few technologies um, and uh, not for uh, not for all. And here uh, this year we're very much focusing also linked to what is very prominent in the recovery plans. And so uh, member states have come forward with uh, re resilience and recovery plans to see how they want to spend the money of the recovery fund and we have asked them to look in particular at renewables uh, renovation and also recharge and refuel um, and so uh, sustainable transport investments and we would like to make sure that of course member states when they spend this this public budget that there is a uh, that this is a forward-looking spending that doesn't um, use outdated technologies but also tries to give a boost to innovation so this year we're looking at um, again wind offshore and onshore pv uh, hydrogen electrolyzers um, batteries um, uh, renewable fuels uh, and also smart grids so we're not looking at hvdc this year but we're looking at um, building management systems um, we're looking at uh, smart grids um, and uh, let's say the the, the smart uh, distribution components um, and uh, at the charging uh, points because of the importance of uh, e-mobility also in the recovery plans. So this is the focus for this year. Uh, we're, um, we're gathering data, we're working hard to see this. I think the, the main point that I want to make here um, is that um, for the renewables, uh, this analysis is to some extent relatively straightforward. Um, and we talk offshore wind, it's quite well defined what we're talking about, what the technologies are, what the value chains are. Uh, for grids, um, this is a bit more tricky because you have a lot of different uh, technologies that together form the grid, as it was very clear from the, from the previous presentations. And so we want to make sure that, um, that, let's say we want to, no, let me say that again. So seeing how they fit into these, um, into this framework is uh, also a continuous, uh, uh, let's say, uh, exploration from our point of view to see how we can improve this. So last year we looked at HVDC and we looked at um, uh, smart grids in terms of digitalization and the, the services being built around it. And then you can easily imagine that not all of these categories that we mentioned here uh, easily fit. And like capacity installed is not really uh, a thing that matters for, for smart grids. So, um, so, so this is a bit of a continuous search. And there again, I think a tool like Technopedia uh, really helps us to also identify what are the different things that we should be looking at and what are the different parts of the grid where technologies matter and where Europe can also uh, lead in terms of innovation and competitiveness as one of the core components of transforming a, a whole energy system into a more renewable energy uh, system. So, this is uh, this is a this is very important work for us, and I think that uh, uh, this Technopedia tool for us will give a lot of inspiration. Um, of course, you can see here that the, the type of indicators we're looking at are um, are not something that you look at in the Technopedia tool. But I think that in terms of us trying to identify what are the different components and how should we look at it, it will be very useful. 
Last year, we tried to also include superconductivity, but we, we realized that we just didn't have enough information to really develop a, a full section around it. Um, but uh, I think one of the key points here is also that this is something that is under continuous development. So we're continuously looking at how can we how can we develop the analysis further? And uh, I presented this yesterday in the Clean Energy Industrial Forum. And one of the key points that was made was also that, you know, we can look at individual technologies, but we, we want to also look at what connects them. And so how can, for example, grid technologies or things like digitalization uh, be a, uh, a cross-cutting element that, that helps the competitiveness of different parts. And what we want to look at this year, for example, is to see how digitalization actually is changing some of the business models. So if we talk about uh, gross value added or the competitiveness, uh, there, you see that there is a, a difference emerging between the ones who develop the technology and the ones who develop the service on top of the technology. And to see how those are linked and what that means for our policies, I think, is very important. And this is how we want to use the report to further develop it and then to look at the reports to help us also develop the, the policies. So very quickly, then uh, what I mentioned before, because I think I should wrap up, wrap up uh, two things. Um, we are using this also as a way to help us to identify what we should prioritize in our eyes in Europe. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, this is not a straight line. Huh? This is input uh, for us to have an analysis of what are actually the things that matter. And it gives us a framework uh, within which we can decide what the priority should be in our eyes in Europe. Um, but th this is here, we're also always looking for <clears throat> new ideas or key issues. And I think, I hope you can see a, so to say, um, uh, change in approach from Horizon 2020 to Horizon Europe, where in Horizon 2020, we were focusing a lot of investment on the smart grids and working with network operators to, make, to, to have demonstrations of how the systemic innovation in a digital grid can work. Now we're going back more to, uh, the, let's say, the hardcore technologies uh, like investing in power electronics, in superconductivity, in HVDC, um, and also in the, the reliability and resilience. So the, the monitoring of the, of the status of the grid and to make sure that it is cyber secure and resilient with a view to the specific specificities of the energy system. So I think this is a, a difference in trend where I think that this, again, this tool that you are developing really helps us to identify what those key technologies are also hardware-wise uh, that we need to support. So I think uh, from our point of view, this is also a source of inspiration and I think a, a, a good basis for a further discussion because we're already now starting to look at the um, the work programs for 2023 and 2024. So I, uh, I, uh, I think that we should um, have a, uh, a follow-up discussion on what uh, this uh, overview and, and the in assessment uh, through the Technopedia tool means for some of the priorities that we're putting out in Horizon Europe in the current work program and what it needs, uh, what it means for the next work programs. And then the last note on the digitalization of energy uh, action plan. So we're working on a action plan on digitalization to see how we can bring let's say synergies between the digital and the green deal transition for the benefit of the of the energy transition um, and there there is one particular issue we're looking at namely how can we push the uptake of it it technologies in the energy sector and uh, and again um, some of the uh, things that you're looking at in uh, this uh, technopedia tool uh, are very helpful for us to identify what those key technologies are. Um, and, and and then, of course, the question for us is what can we then do about it? How can we support this? Some things may be a matter of, again, Horizon Europe or Digital Europe program type of funding, but are there also other things we can do? Uh, and like one of the previous speakers mentioned on, um, on the uh, dynamic line rating, and there is always a link with the regulatory framework. So what can we do to further promote the uptake of those IT technologies in the energy sector is, is a question that is high on our agenda. So also for that, uh, I would really welcome a follow-up discussion. Sorry if I was a bit long, but I hope it was interesting nevertheless. And, um, and again, thanks for this work, for this tool, and for organizing this webinar. I think it's uh, really uh, very useful for us, and I hope a good, a good basis for a continuous discussion among us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, and also for uh, drawing up already some uh, potential synergies. Maybe we can discuss this further in the uh, in the panel discussion part.
But before that, I would give the floor to Ivan Pineda, who is uh, director for public affairs at uh, Wind Europe, because uh, Wind Europe is also uh, published last year a uh, paper, which was uh, taking into account grid, op grid optimization technologies, which could, uh, which could support uh, the boom of uh, wind energy. So the floor is yours, Ivan. Thank you very much and congratulations again. Um, indeed, last year, Wind Europe published a position paper, how to make the most out of Europe's grid. And we had a four elements rationale in our paper. First of all, we saw that electricity uh, as, as, as a share of the total energy uh, will increase significantly for Europe to reach uh, net zero. We believe that it's going to be twice the current demand of electricity than is today. The second element is that renewables, as uh, the Commission has said, will take most of the supply, uh, more than 80% of the supply of electricity in that net zero um, uh, um, system, energy system uh, uh, scenario. And wind will be 50%. Uh, will be supplying 50% of that electricity. The third element is on screen in the um, uh, slide that I'm showing. Clearly, Europe will need to expand its electricity system. We believe it's going to be more than double its annual grid infrastructure investments in order to reach this climate neutrality. And just as a side comment, this is six times more the current 10 y NDP level of investments. But please click. But we realize also that uh, grids take a long time to actually be built. If you can please animate the slide. So therefore, we need to make again. Uh, if you can click again, we need to make the most out of our current assets. And therefore, this is why we wanted to have a discussion with uh, several stakeholders, including the TSOs and 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 uh, Wind Europe members, uh, generators. OEM torre manufacturers, as well as developer, how to maximize this uh, grid utilization with a very uh, um, uh, wide deployment of grid optimization technologies. Next slide, please. So what is uh, to gain here? Well, clearly for society, there will be savings in our view. The German situation today, as an example, is uh, uh, an illustrative uh, um, a, a picture of what could happen, uh, you know, even an exacerbated way. Um, One billion euros a year in congestion management is something that uh, we think it has a solution if we are able to deploy not only more grids, but also if we are able to optimize the existing capacity of our assets. Clearly for uh, TSOs and for the system development, there are other system benefits, increasing the power transfer capacity of the lines. Uh, we learned from uh, uh, Rina just uh, earlier, having a much better control of the sagging of the lines, for example, or increasing the flows of, of uh, electricity or power, the voltage, etc. But for TSOs, importantly, what is going to be uh, really crucial is whether they would be able to actually defer or not certain um, investments. What is for the wind energy industry and renewables as a whole in this? Uh, next slide, please. Well, basically, we think that by deploying grid optimization technologies, we can accelerate wind energy integration and renewables integration as a whole by enabling closer uh, operation to the limits and maximizing uh, the capacity transfer, as, as we have learned from some technologies, as well as contributing to mitigate some of the variability and reduce the, cons the, the, the curtailment of uh, uh, wind energy. So in our um, exercise in, in reaching out uh, TSOs and other industry stakeholders, we compiled also a list of those technologies that we believe had a, a high potential for being deployed and that are already commercially available in all the cases that we found. If you can click, please. Um, and what is important, many of you have already presented that there is a good level of TRL in a lot of the technologies. 
what we focus it wasn't about that technology readiness in our paper, but what is the maturity of using those technologies across uh, several uh, uh, TSOs. There will be some technologies that are widely used by some TSOs, and there will be some TSOs that they will be widely developing and implementing these technologies. So this is not about TRL, but this was about how frequent and to what extent these technologies are actually deployed. And what we found indeed, as many of you have said, uh, technology is not the barrier, but it is more about the incentives that are set in regulation. So from all the technologies that we define here, 18 that uh, I, I uh, quickly look at the Technopedia are fully covered in the exercise that uh, ENSO is doing. Um, we found that there are some barriers for wider deployment. So next slide, please. Now, these barriers uh, include lack of standards for a lot of these grid optimization technologies. There is also an element of the CBA, the cost benefit analysis, not fully incorporating what uh, these grid optimization technologies could bring into the picture. The cost recovery are not fully embedded into these analysis and methodologies of CBA, particularly because they are focused a lot on the CAPEX elements. A lot of the TSOs make those investments fully based on the incentives and the CAPEX uh, gains uh, and rewards that they can get. So we are looking at a, a better incentivized, what we call the TOTEX, and, and, and you may have heard this obviously before, which is CAPEX plus, plus OPEX uh, uh, um, system benefits and, and move away from only the investments uh, uh, assessments in CBAs. And obviously, including the grid optimization uh, technologies in, in wider system planning. Um, many of the TSOs, many of you are already incorporating the short term uh, congestion management uh, tools for uh, in these technologies and how you can much better uh, manage the grids uh, with these technologies. Then we look at obviously aligning a lot of this planning with the objectives for the Green Deal and also the implementation of the clean energy package and what it's going to come now with the future Fit for 55 package that Mark just presented. And we would like that the TSOs have a much more continuous, open and flexible planning so that whenever there is a new technology coming into the market, they are able to include that into their uh, planning, that this is not fully set as it is today with regulators, but that is more dynamic and that these technologies can be included uh, in, in this process. And obviously, incentivize a lot of these technologies in cross-border infrastructure planning, a hint to the current T, T, 10E regulation that is going to be discussed after the summer. Now, there is no EU framework for actually assessing grid uh, technologies and whether we are advocating for one or not, it's very important that we have some smart indicators to give us exactly what is the benefits of all these technologies. And this is what we call on to the European Commission. We have presented our paper and a lot of these slides to, to the colleagues uh, of Mark um, for, for making a study uh, together probably with ENSOE and now this great example with the Technopedia on enabling the, what it will be the efficiency of applying all these grid optimization technologies in planning? What are the barriers? Mark alluded to the regulatory barriers because, um, as I said, uh, technology is there and there will be a lot of good uh, benefits uh, to get there, but they need to be fully recognized uh, in, in a regulatory framework. So for us, it's extremely important that this is taken on board. And uh, with this, I think uh, this is a very short uh, introduction to probably what is going to be the panel. And I'm conscious about time, so I would like to wrap up just now and maybe we can open the discussion. Thank you very much, Ivan. And uh, indeed, I would like to ask you to, to stay on the virtual floor as uh, we can already prepare for the uh, for the panel discussion, where I would like to invite back uh, Mark. Uh, Susan, who will this time uh, more maybe represent uh, current as board of the uh, chair of board. Also, Johan uh, representing TND Europe. Uh, and uh, I would like to also invite 
Urosh Sarobir, who is uh, the vice chair of uh, the RDI committee of uh, ENSOE, and uh, Christos uh, from working group Flexibility and Markets, also under the RDI committee. And I would like to also invite Norella Constantinescu, head of innovation at ENSOE. And I give it over to you, Norella. Thank you very much, uh, Laurent. So we have a challenge to go fast <laughs> with this uh, panel uh, discussion in order still to uh, to finish uh, in time. And I would like to uh, take the first uh, question. So based on what we heard today uh, from Karen, from uh, TND Europe, from uh, European Commission, from uh, Wind Europe, and also from ENSOE, uh, so uh, our association, uh, we are now in the uh, in the urgency of 2020-2030. We have big ambitions for, for 2030 and we need um, actually uh, to put together the development of RES together with the development of, of the grid. And we hear different solutions for uh, actually uh, uh, achieving uh, that uh, those targets, if possible. So I would like to um, ask you, uh, what you see as um, major quick wins for this period 2020, uh, 20, 20, 30 in terms of the technologies at least we uh, heard uh, today. So where the focus uh, should should be. And I would like to uh, start maybe uh, with uh, Urosh, who didn't uh, speak. <laughs> until now, so the Vice Chair of uh, Research Development and Innovation Committee uh, in ANSOI, Urosh. Yeah, I think the quick wins are, are where we could actually lean on the on the current grids, on the optimization of, of what we already have. And um, it, it's a challenge because uh, somehow, uh, yes, uh, the, the environmental conditions under which we have to build new infrastructure are extremely hard for all of us. Uh, but once we go into the smart grid, uh, and uh, I would call it uh, grid optimization and then the efficiency solutions, we we are faced with with the regulatory frameworks, which was also discussed today. So for me, definitely, uh, uh, I'm. I'm, I'm a strong promoter of the second. Uh, I think we should uh, uh, tackle this, these challenges uh, uh, related to regulatory frameworks um, because they're still much easier to, to, to handle than, than the environmental uh, issues which, which we have had. But um, let, let this be for now uh, my statement. Thank you, uh, Urosh. Um, Johan, from your perspective, uh, how you see um, actually the new developments, uh, especially, for example, regarding the uh, offshore wind, and of course, what is uh, in in front of us with the uh, 60 gigawatt, uh, uh, which has to be deployed by, by 2030? Well, uh, thank you very much. I think we, we have seen already that integrating these huge offshore capacities will require different approaches than we had so far and here we are of course not only talking about adding new flexible operational things to an existing grid here we are talking about developing and agreeing and implementing a, a new type of grid uh, and I think that's very important. We need to proactively tackle this challenge, which is more a midterm, I'm hesitant to say long term challenge. We certainly would prefer it being more long term, but you addressed the urgency already, so we don't have that much time. But we need to come to these new concepts together. And I think we have done really good steps over the past two, three years in, in doing this jointly, much closer cooperating than ever before. And then bringing into practical experience, Mark also indicated the traditional innovation process, which used to be a little bit more sequential. I don't think we have that time anymore. We need to find ways to, to prove 
uh, ready technological readiness of, of bulk technologies we are not talking about small things here for the offshore market jointly together and and as fast as possible and i think the key for that is cooperate from the very beginning in the conceptual phase agree on how we believe to master this future and then jointly working on maturing the the, the necessary solutions and coming back to the topic of today's webinar i think technopedia is an excellent example also because it is a platform where we discuss these things together and and uh, and and i think this is an extremely important element of how to manage any future techno uh, technological challenge we have to master uh, innovation new ideas new concepts and and bringing them into practical use is a key success factor and a key lever for managing this transition we're in it's not something we may decide about use or not as innovation used to be in the past when we had a stable system we didn't have real problems so we always had the option to do something new or not but in this moving into this new future we this is not an alternative we, we have to find new solutions we are depending on innovation and we need to seize this opportunity together Thank you, uh, Johan. Now I am I am uh, switching to Suzanne and uh, Christos. So uh, we have heard um, about uh, these uh, new um, um, new um, and uh, actually smart solutions for uh, actually avoiding the cost remedial um, actions uh, from from you Suzanne and all, all also from Rena. On the other hand, of course, we we also have to look. Um, at distribution level uh, as well. So from your point uh, of view, uh, in order to uh, overcome this hurdle of uh, having this deployment of, uh, of mass renewables uh, North Sea or in the South, uh, bringing to the consumption centers and maximizing uh, the uh, uh, existing uh, uh, infrastructure. So which would be uh, for you the, ma the major uh, element on which we should look upon regulation or other things. Suzanne. Thanks a lot, uh, Norila, for, for this very good question. Yeah, There's a couple of, of comments on this one. Definitely regulation is very important and many elements have been mentioned, like Ivan uh, mentioning this CAPEX uh, point, yeah, which is add to this one. Uh, maybe it's not even focusing now on TOTEX, but it's more focusing on solutions. We would expect the tenders simply to say, here's the challenge. Give me the solution that can address it, to be more open for solutions. There's also just in Germany now the update of the incentive regulation that puts, like in the Netherlands, like in the UK, a bonus malus system on congestion and curtailment costs on the TSO. And I think it's it's a kind of, a, while it doesn't maybe hurt that way, but it enables maybe the TSO to, to better find solution than just claiming those costs as being not influential. I think that's important too. Uh, I think uh, the cooperation with the TSOs represented by, by NCOE is, is really also very good and the challenges are very high. So we need to, to see an acknowledgement that this is a matter of long term. We have huge investments coming up in the US, in the EU, only in Germany is 84 to 100 billion euros only on high voltage transmission by 2030. Uh, so we need to see that this is for the next 40 years what we are doing here. And we need to build in, and that's maybe a call to, to Mark as well, and the Commission and then to put into those investments in order to avoid them to be stranded. Um, these innovation points, yeah. And I find really the Technopedia is a very important instrument because of the contents and because of the process. And I would just hope that the Commission now with the next CTIR report, Mark, would use it, uh, build it into the CTIR and just make this the reference or the smart grid indicator, make this a reference. Yeah? And to conclude, um, in 2019, the Infrastructure Forum has seen a very important report by ECORIS, University of Vienna and some others. And somehow it, it is remaining on the shelf and it needs to be implemented. Everything has been said and it needs to be implemented and the lessons from these regulatory lessons need to be learned uh, from that. Those are the points that I would mention. Uh, just do it, uh, build on cooperation, enhance Technopedia and uh, be open for new solutions. We need a toolbox of solutions that current represent. There will be many others that we don't even know today. Suzanne, Christos, from your side, 
uh, activating the distributed flexibility is how we <laughs> how we uh, support actually uh, the uh, challenge in front of us. Correct. So um, flexibility, uh, I think, will be the main challenge for future grids, and it's a combination of smart solutions. It's a combination of uh, evolving the already high TRL technologies into the business as usual of the TSOs. But also we have uh, the incentives to uh, decentralize the system in sense of utilization of distributed energy resources. And there uh, we have still a lot of challenges in the sense that we have evolved and uh, these are the outcomes of many Horizon 2020 Europe. We have evolved in the sense of uh, establishing flexibility platforms. We have even commercial cases in Europe. We have actual research projects that are very mature and still can utilize the flexibility provided by distributed energy resources. Still, we have more uh, steps towards this. That means we need more harmonization. We need to give more incentives to flexibility service providers and we see to analyze further if these platforms can be uh, integrated and if so what are the benefits for the integration with the other wholesale electricity markets thank you christos now i turn to you uh, mark because you are like this on my my screen but in a way uh, it's encompassing uh, what we have heard uh, until now so um your um view on uh, the development of uh, this competitiveness progress uh, report but also what you mentioned before the bridge uh, initiative and of course uh, yeah what is coming in terms of tenny and and so on so uh, we have heard today mostly uh, uh, we uh, showcase uh, mo mostly uh, these uh, uh, grid optimization uh, technologies. Uh, of course, we have heard before the, the superconducting uh, technology as, uh, as well. So uh, in your view, uh, you said that now you would try to focus more on the new technologies. Uh, how uh, you will see these developments uh, which are needed uh, right right now. So you mentioned also the electromobility, and I agree with you. So this is something which is going to come all together in this period 2020, 2030. So where you think uh, we should focus and how we can support actually the development uh, of, uh, of this evidence you are creating? Um, yeah, great. Thanks, uh, thanks Norella. That's, that's a good question. Um, and but then maybe I need to mention a few things uh, because I think um, yeah the so the competitiveness progress support I think is is one tool and so um, that uh, let's say from the from the structure of it actually better fits so to say the traditional technologies like um, you know. Well, traditional. I mean, it sounds good if we talk about traditional when we talk about offshore wind and PV, but you, you know what I mean, right? Um, so, uh, so the, the 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 grid and the grid technologies uh, require more of an effort from us uh, in terms of the ability to integrate that into the structure. But as I said, uh, from our point of view, it's very important to make that effort to 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 show that this is a, a systemic transformation and not a, you know, uh, a, a matter of just investing in renewables. It's, you know, the bigger challenge is also how does it come into the grid and what are the technologies there and how do we also use them to, to lead the way uh, as Europe uh, in, in a global uh, market that is, uh, you know, that's bound to grow. And I think actually that one of the, one of the strong points that we have in the EU to to show with the energy transition is the fact that we are able to integrate, you know, more and more and more and more renewables, uh, and we keep our high um, standards of, of of reliability and security of supply. And I think this is, you know, this is also, of course, a big, big, big complement to the to the network operators uh, because this is primarily their responsibility. But it, it shows that um, that this transition can work, and I think that is a very important. Um, uh, signal to the rest of the world and it means that there are a lot of technologies that we have in Europe and a lot of experience that we have in Europe 
um, that uh, that other par parts of the world uh, are interested in and can benefit from. So I think that's why we, we want to keep this um, this grid and integration dimension in the progress report. Um, and we for you know last year and this year we do that by zooming in on different parts of the technologies of the grid. So this I think is a um, uh, yeah a work in progress and also continuous improvement. And I think it, uh, based on this technopedia for us, I think it would be very interesting to see what can we, what should we focus on na next year, and like what are key technologies where, uh, where we basically see a growth market where we have a good uh, that are important in the EU, and where we can also pr produce a, an interesting set of data to show how we are doing in this technology. But I think um, this is not, of course, not the only tool in related to the agenda that we are discussing here today is how can we use a, a tool like Technopedia to to speed up the market uptake of, uh, of, of grid technologies. So, the, you know, the CPR is one thing and it's, let's say, a, a piece of the puzzle. Um, I think that, uh, the, um, that the, the things that uh, Ivan mentioned on, um, on, on the regulatory framework and also Susanna going from CAPEX to, to TOTEX, we uh, with the clean energy package, we set these requirements, but of course, uh, operationalizing that is is a is a national responsibility of regulators, where we can give guidance, but um, where uh, primarily it's for, for the regulators to see how this works. And I, I think here, if if there are issues there that we need to uh, address, then you know, then then we need to then we need to uh, do so. And um, I think that. Um, so the, maybe the, the interaction with the regulators on how can we um, promote the uptake of, of new technologies as part of the grid development uh, is, is an important area to focus on. And I think also the timing is right because we're going into the clean energy package implementation mode. Um, so I think this, this is a key issue and a key, a key issue to focus on, um, which is of course not primarily our unit, but still for as a DG, I think it's important. And then the last thing, maybe the, uh, the the grid smartness was mentioned as something to uh, you know to use as a tool to see how are we actually developing the grid because I think that's also a bit from from the different interventions in the discussion. It's you know you, you can do many uh, small things, but we need to do a lot of things at the same time. And how do they help us creating a better grid? And how are different uh, network operators or different countries doing in that area, um, we we need some kind of way to to monitor that. And I now this is actually also a question back to you because some of these things you may know better. But I think that in the clean energy package there is a, a provision on monitoring the the smartness of the grid that is yeah. still uh, you know a bit. Uh, also open for further development and implementation. And this is something that we're also looking at from the digitalization point of view, because of course we can talk a lot about digitalization of energy and how important it is, but, um, and and uh, ah, yeah. and one thing I should mention also in relation to the comments, so creating flexibility markets is also a big priority there and making the data exchange to underpin that flexibility markets possible is one of the core uh, priorities for our action plan. But with that, we are also looking at how can we then monitor how this digitalization is progressing. And so also for that, we are looking at this provision in the, in the I think it's the electricity directive on a, on a smartness of the grid indicator. And we already have one for buildings, but uh, here on, on the grid to see if we can also define some criteria to be able to monitor it. So I think these are, and so it's more than just CPR, but I think these are, let's say, the four areas that we uh, we we want to focus on. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Indeed, uh, we are working actually also on on uh, on this type of work stream uh, regarding the smart grid indicators, um, with the, together with the TSOs. It's also a little bit the work we we also uh, carry out now with the, with Acer to see how actually these uh, innovative solutions can can be taken. And last, uh, in order to let some time also to Urosh to to say a few things about the future of the Technopedia, uh, Ivan. So. So 
we we listen actually to uh, to 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 the grid uh, technologies and, and and so on uh, still in in uh, the competitiveness uh, report so uh, renewables uh, will be uh, will be assessed so from your perspective uh, we talked a lot about uh, this common uh, work which we have to do together and the line um, including from the planning stage uh, this uh, this development uh, in uh, between the wind and uh, and uh, the the grid so uh, which is your take from from this discussion my my take is there is a lot of good work that has taken uh, place now I think uh, ENSOE has done a tremendous big steps now in the way that is managing the 10-year network development plan in 2022, whenever, whenever it's about planning. Um, we are in the right track when it comes to um, looking at the scenarios and looking at making the grid ready for when it comes to renewables. One of the main concerns that we had over, over the years was um, making sure that the grid was not a bottleneck for the development of renewables, given the very, very fast pace of development. We fully understand grid development takes time. It really does. And we have learned that by looking at how um, so many projects um, uh, from, from generation, you know, had, had issues and difficulties. But that now is starting to look much better. And, and we really congratulate for the work that ENSOE is doing when it comes to the planning in the 10-year network development plan in 2022, as well as with this work in Technopedia. This is a great start. One suggestion from my side and from Wind Europe community would be you have in the Technopedia the TRL. We really encourage you to now also look at how frequent these technologies are deployed. What's the maturity of use? And we have this in our paper also. Um, you have best practice there, good examples, excellent compilation. It will be extremely helpful for the regulators, as Mark said, to understand how frequent, to what extent you are already making these technologies part of your systems. Because to, to that extent, they will understand that they are there. They are not only research uh, projects and, and, and things that uh, you know we will be dealing in Horizon Europe, uh, but they are there. So therefore, there needs to be urgent regulatory changes to keep incentivizing TSOs to use them. Thank you, Ivan. Now I pass to you, uh, Laurent, uh, so because you are the master of the ceremony today. So I would like to thank uh, uh, all of you. So uh, Ivan, Mark, uh, Suzanne, Johan, Uros, Christos for these uh, insights and also for uh, feeding uh, back to us uh, your views on uh, Technopedia, but also on uh, uh, the focus for the, the next uh, 10 years and the uh, quick wins, urgent things to, 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 to take. Thanks. Thank you, Norella, and thank you for all the panelists for this dynamic uh, discussion. I personally would have uh, liked to, to listen to it uh, a little bit further because it was very interesting, all your insights. And uh, maybe this gives uh, us a good ground to, to organize uh, similar webinars in the course of, uh, of fall or the, uh, or the end of the year. But of course, uh, with the details, we'll, we'll come back to you on this. And now I pass the floor to Uros to, to present as a closing uh, what we see as uh, next steps for the Technopedia. Yes, uh, it was a great uh, exchange of information today. And uh, I think Technopedia can really bring the right people together uh, and can provide the right exchange of information, which is, which is the key uh, for, for the progress. Um, we were looking a little bit into what we can do better in the future, uh, and um, you have uh, um, uh, on the screen, uh, if you, Laurent, go just one slide forward, you have the, the contact point on which we would like to have as much uh, feedback from you on the Technopedia and on uh, what you would like to see more, and uh, the way in which we present these technologies is also the key for us. And I would like to encourage everybody really to, to take time to think now, maybe immediately after this event, uh, and to give us the feedback on, on what we could do better in the future. Just to promote and, and to provoke uh, your thoughts on, on what we could actually do better. And uh, maybe this is also a bit of a questioner for you, 
whether you would like to have something different and we estimate i will i will go through like four proposals which we have worked on uh, with, with with colleagues and um, and and maybe this information might trigger for you some some thoughts and some feedbacks which please should be provided on this uh, info uh, at nsue.e. So the first thing I would like to mention out of four is that we are uh, somehow seeing the Technopedia as as, 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 a, as a live document, as a, as a live text, as, a, as something what is really interactive and should be updated. So our, our updates, as Mark said before, should, should be focused on this one to two years period and, and we will try to stick uh, to this. Now the updating process uh, of course uh, is as it is. Maybe you can have some ideas on how to improve the efficiency on transparency of these uh, updates. So if, if you have any suggestions uh, on how we could do this better, please uh, give us the feedback. About the new content, um, uh, we have been thinking a little bit uh, to explore the, the cross-sector solutions because Maybe this was not so so deeply uh, 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 in, included in the current versions. So please give us feedback on this idea. And maybe because we are now quite strongly in the TSO world, that we should also open a little bit into the DSO solution. So uh, if if we include the DSO world in the techno Technopedia, of course this will. Uh, call us to, to think uh, in a bit different aspect than it was today. Of course, there are some elements of, of flexibility which are already included, uh, but, but uh, DSO solutions, is, of course, are, are, are a huge uh, 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 pile of, of, of elements which we could add here. Uh, the third out of four element is a bit more provocative that uh, maybe we shouldn't so much look into new solutions, into new trends, but more to go a bit deeper into existing uh, trends and look how they could uh, progress in and how could be their perspective in the 2050 framework and give this what if element into the Technopedia as such, because this is not uh, uh, given at the moment. So to look, to look closer at the, at the grid development needs and, and what should be done with these particular technologies and then in the what if scenario, for example, what if the batteries become the dominant uh, 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 technology and, and it will be so cheap and, and nobody will care for anything about the rest and uh, what happens in this case. So uh, let's see, let's say that this is a, a perspective which could be added to the existing uh, Technopedia solutions. Uh, the fourth element to provoke your thoughts is uh, should the Technopedia stay EU? Should the Technopedia stay with us? Uh, should we open uh, to become global? Should we uh, contact uh, uh, North Americans, uh, con contact with NERC, should, should we bring it uh, to a global scene with Sigre or anyone else? So here the, the, the biggest challenge for us is whether we want to keep the control on this contents, which is now, you know, so the, the framework which we have is actually allowing us to, to have a good control or to really become global more like a standardization uh, uh, platform, which please give us the feedback, what would you see uh, rather? And um, it, it's open discussion, we cannot uh, simply say one is better than the other. Uh, and uh, the, the fifth element, uh, it was discussed very closely, this is additional element to the four I wanted to present because there was so much discussion on it, the regulatory support. So at the moment, our regulatory support schemes were more targeting the smart grid key performer indicators. This is something what we already did with, with many stakeholders. We did not find a good way to link these regulatory incentives and, and uh, I would say the market uptakes on the technologies which we have listed here. But maybe we could change. So maybe we could switch from these smart grid KPIs into the world of Technipedia and then add maybe elements from the regulatory perspective, so how these technolo technologies could better perform from the from regulatory aspects if they have the right support schemes, if they have uh, different uh, support schemes given by the by by regulators, NRAs. But but you know that this is a very uh, touchy element, and uh, I would like to close my uh, 
provocations here. So if you find uh, yourself suitable to give us any feedback on these four plus one uh, elements, we would be very glad to have it from you. Laurent, Norella? Thank you, Rosh. I think we only had uh, have time to, to close this webinar, so I uh, thank all the participants who attended this uh, this webinar today and all the speakers who, who contributed. And uh, of course, thank you very much for the co-organizers, uh, TND Europe and, uh, and Current and uh, Norella and the whole innovation team. Special thanks for Carlotta, who was behind the screen during the whole event. And uh, I wish you a very nice summer break and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.